Welcome to Bible Fiber. I am Shelley Neese, president of the Jerusalem Connection, a Christian organization devoted to sharing the story of the people of Israel, both ancient and modern. This week, we are continuing our study of the book of Ezra, diving into chapter 4. Until this point in our story, the returning Judeans experienced a honeymoon period. King Cyrus, captor turned liberator, gave them permission to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their nation. Not only that, but Cyrus insisted on flooding them with gifts. The journey seems to have passed without any trouble, or at least no incident made it in the narrative. They settled back in their former homes and soon built an altar that allowed them to renew their religious calendar. Only once they laid the foundation of the temple did they meet their first bump in the road, local opposition. Chapter 4 is the pin to pop the adversity-free balloon in the story of their return. Once introduced in our section today, conflict, intrigue, and drama become a continuous theme throughout the rest of Ezra and Nehemiah. When the temple preparations got underway, the locals made what seemed like a reasonable proposition to Zerubbabel and the family leaders. Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of King Esardon of Assyria, who brought us here. The narrator introduces the local people as the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. How have they already developed an adversarial relationship barely two years after their return to the land? Without knowing exactly what happened in those two years of transition, we only have our imaginations and a few textual clues to try and fill in the gaps. To be sure, The sudden arrival of a caravan of 50,000 newcomers would be jarring to any local population. Also remember that in the genealogical records given in Ezra 2, many of the returnees still possessed property claims to their ancestral lands. In the half century of their absence, local people surely moved into the evacuated homes and squatted on the unclaimed land. The narrative does not describe evictions, but we assume Judeans started an eviction process soon after their arrival. Nothing like kicking people off their land to get neighborly relationships off on a bad foot. When the Judeans insisted on building their altar atop the site of the former altar in Solomon's temple, they likely had to tear down an altar actively being used by the locals. The narrator had mentioned in the context of altar building that the returnees were in dread of the people of the lands. If indeed the locals had been sacrificing to Yahweh as they claimed, they were likely doing so atop the ruins of the first temple. The returnees may have pushed them out, stoking the fires of tension even more. The people of the lands is the narrator's generic term for the hodgepodge of locals who populated the former lands of Israel and Judah. Many were foreigners who centuries before were captured and resettled by the Assyrians. When the locals approached Sari Bubble to offer their assistance with the temple rebuild, they introduced themselves as the descendants of the deportees that King Esardon captured and planted in the land. The former Assyrian Empire was famous for their policy of forced dispersions. When they conquered new territories, they uprooted populations and planted them in other newly acquired lands. The evacuations were never quite total, which led to intermixing between natives and the new arrivals. The policy was meant to break down national loyalties and reinforce submission to the empire. In 722 BCE, Assyria conquered the kingdom of Israel and captured their capital Samaria, deporting the Israelites and resettling the land with foreigners. The Judean leaders do not mince words in their rejection of the locals' offer to help. You shall have no part with us in building a house for our God, but we alone will build for the Lord, the God of Israel. Without any background information, the Judeans' refusal of what seems like friendly assistance is rude and off-putting. Why exclude anyone from worshiping the one true God if they so desire? The narrator of Ezra does not provide justification for Zeri Bubble's rejection of the locals. However, 2 Kings 17 gives us the backstory. In the 8th century BCE, the kingdom of Israel was decimated. 
Rather than leaving the lands depopulated, the king of Assyria deported other captured peoples from the east and placed them in the cities of Samaria. When the new arrivals did not worship the God of Abraham and they did not follow the laws of the land, God sent lions to attack them. The Assyrian authorities rightly interpreted the lion attacks as a divine curse. In response, the king of Assyria sent one of the captive Jewish priests back to Samaria to teach the foreigners the ways of Yahweh. At the very least, the Jewish priest was a good luck charm, meant to stem the bad fortunes that had cursed the community. Though the foreigners added Yahweh to their pantheon, they never worshipped Yahweh solely. They blended Yahwehism with their own ancestral religions and built shrines to their own national gods all over Samaria. If you are Zeri Bubble, you do not want any part of that style of Yahweh worship. Ezra is commentating on events two centuries after Assyria forcefully changed the demographics of the region. Remarkably, the people of the land still identified as the descendants of the deportees of the east. Granted, the population swap recounted in 2 Kings 17 occurred during the reign of King Sargon II. The locals in Ezra say King Asardon planted them in Israel. There's not a historical record of Asardon's deportation campaign to and from Samaria, but it is still a completely feasible event. Because the peoples of the land have revered Yahweh for 200 years before the arrival of the Judean caravan, they feel justified in participating in the temple project. The remnant, however, are pure monotheists, and they see the syncretism of the people of the land as threatening. For the remnant, Yahweh cannot be one God among many. He is the one and only God. The remnant of Judah understood from the pre-exilic prophets that the reason God allowed the overthrow of Israel by Assyria and Judah by Babylon was because the pre-exilic generation was not faithful to the covenant. Repeatedly, they were lured in by the idolatry of the surrounding peoples, worshiping pagan gods alongside Yahweh. Even though the prophets constantly warned them against the detestable practice, they never fully rejected idolatry. When the punishment of captivity was over, God spoke through the post-exilic prophet Zechariah to warn them, do not be like your ancestors. In response, the people repented for the sins of the past, committing themselves to return from their evil ways and deeds. With this commitment in mind, it makes sense why the community could not afford compromising with pagans. Even if the peoples of the land recognized Yahweh in some form, they knew from experience where that road led, and they did not want to risk God's judgment of syncretism again. When the elders rebuffed the locals' proposition, the locals went on the offensive. They had two aggressive tactics in their plans to stop the Judeans from rebuilding the temple and city. During the reigns of King Cyrus and King Darius, they tried bribing Persian officials to hassle the exiles. During the reign of later kings, they went on a letter-writing campaign. Starting in verse 6, the author of Ezra made an unusual literary choice to flash forward into the future. He briefly referenced a letter the locals sent to King Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus, also known in Greek as Xerxes I, was the husband of Esther. Even without the inclusion of the actual letter, it is safe to assume the locals were complaining about the Jews and asked the king to halt the construction in Jerusalem. The text does not include a reply to the locals' letter, and it seems to have been of no consequence. I like to think that after the Haman incident, Xerxes I was fed up with conspiracies against the Jews. The rest of the chapter is composed of a letter of opposition from the locals written to King Artaxerxes and the king's response. The narrator misplaced the letters chronologically since most of the other events of Ezra occurred in the 6th century BCE. The letters refer to future events in the 5th century BCE. If modern grammar were in play, the author may have placed all verses 7 through 23 in brackets, or even better, place the whole letter as a footnote. Ultimately, the letters show the author's intention to stay on the theme of local opposition to the restoration process. At least for this section of the story, the choice to stay on theme took priority over linear chronology, even if the insertion felt like a digression. 
Why were some copies of letters included and not others? The author surely had access to historical archives in Jerusalem, and he shared the firsthand evidence of what Israel was up against in the Persian period. One scholarly theory is that he used a letter from a later time than the events he was chronicling because he did not have archival material from the initial wave of returnees. In place of those older records, he used letters written closer to his own time, but reflecting the aggressive tactics of the local population. Personally, I find the tone of the letters irritating. The locals come off as manipulative snitches, and you know what they say about snitches. They introduce themselves in the letter as loyal subjects of the empire who were merely looking out for the king's best interests. The letter read, It is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor. The king, for his part, was mostly innocent, the victim of misinformation. However, the imperial commitment to the Jerusalem rebuild was clearly weakened since the reign of Cyrus. During the reign of Cyrus, the Persian Empire was a sturdy bulwark, unchallenged and unrivaled. By the time of Artaxerxes, the political situation had changed. The Persian Empire had for many years been struggling to suppress Egyptian and Greek uprisings. The locals in Israel knew that the king was not reading the letters from a position of strength, so they manipulated his fears, purposefully wording the letter to trigger the king's concerns of sedition. They planted the idea that the Jews were historically rebellious and untrustworthy. The letter exaggerated the threat even further, suggesting, hypothetically, that if the Jews rebel, they might bring the whole region beyond the river into their seditious orbit. Because the letter dated much later than the rest of Ezra, the temple had been standing for 50 years in the time of Artaxerxes. The process the locals wanted interrupted is the rebuilding of Jerusalem's city walls, the initiative that later Nehemiah will complete. Trying to manipulate the king's own insecurities, they warned, if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, customer toll, and the royal revenue will be reduced. The letter encouraged the king to perform a search himself of the archives. The king did not need to only take their word for the history of rebellion in Judah. After an internal investigation on the history of Judah, Artaxerxes uncovered evidence that Historic Israel was a rebellious people and a consistent enemy of the empires. Though his response did not say exactly what he found, he referred to the mighty kings in Israel's past. Presumably, the Assyrians came across records of King Hezekiah's resistance to the Assyrians and further evidence of King Jehoiakim's alliance with Egypt and revolt against Babylon. Artaxerxes' response to the locals was definitive. He issued an order that these people— the Judean returnees, be made to cease and that the city not be rebuilt. Only once we get to the book of Nehemiah will we find out how the crisis was resolved. The chapter ends with the statement, at that time the work on the house of God in Jerusalem stopped and was discontinued until the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. The bracketed glimpse into the future is over. The author started with the building of the temple made a long digression about a future event, and jumped right back to the temple project. Ezra 4-5 left off with the reign of Darius, moved through two other Persian kings, and Ezra 4-24 returns to the reign of Darius. The author's storytelling technique underlined the seriousness of the ongoing obstacles the Judeans faced in rebuilding their temple and the city. By covering a grand sweep of history— The writer demonstrated how the tension with neighbors persisted throughout the reigns of Cyrus, Darius, Ahasuerus, and Artaxerxes. One long period of persecution was brought into a single narrative. Presenting the full scale of local opposition also reframed Zerubbabel's flat refusal of local involvement with the temple project. Though the offer seems benign at first, this was not a group of people who had Israel's best interest in mind, as the letters make clear. As a storyteller, I cannot help but pick up on a possible underlying motive for the author's insertion of the response from Artaxerxes. In his response, the king discovers that Jerusalem has had mighty kings who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Knowing that glorious history, the king might stop the city from growing in strength or reviving their independence. 
did the author use reverse psychology on his Judean audience? Was he indirectly encouraging the weak and powerless remnant by reminding them that even foreign leaders remembered the glory days of pre-exilic Israel? Telling and retelling one's story is the greatest way to retrace the hand of God in our lives. The work stoppage had hit the people hard. They had been riding a high of prophetic fulfillment since the Edict of Cyrus, certain they were part of God's big restart plan. The local opposition so soon after their arrival threw cold water on their hopes. The author of Ezra reminded his audience that local and imperial opposition was nothing new in Israel's story. God had delivered them before and will continue delivering them. Thank you for listening and please continue to participate in this Bible reading challenge. Next week, we are reading Ezra 5, the prophet step onto the scene. For all the biblical references each week, please see the show transcript on our blog or by signing up for our emails at thejerusalemconnection.us. I don't say all the references in the podcast, but they are all in the transcript. Send me a message, I'll respond. Bible Fiber is available on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Shabbat Shalom.